very little recognized paper. Ten citations in ten years means maybe some more people have seen it, but essentially it means that yeah, someone has seen it, but essentially just some local climate environment. But then suddenly there was this hype about chaos theory, and it seems in one year this this paper got uh, three thousand citations after after people dis discovered the chaos theory. So if you publish your first paper and you think it was really a good work, you are frustrated that no one seems to look at it ever. Who knows? <laughs> you know, maybe you get lucky. <laughs> and in, if it's in 100 years, OK, you will not notice any more. <laughs> but if it's in a 10 years' time after you publish your first work and people discover it, then you, know, you may become famous at that point at least. Who knows? Normally it's not like that, but uh, <laughs> there are a few of these stories. Um, yeah, so you, you never lo lose hope. Maybe you know this can, this exists. This, something like this can happen. So and since then, this type of equations is studied as very much in, in mathematics, ma mathematical methods that go way beyond my knowledge of mathematics. So even at ICTP, there's Stefano Luzzato, who is a mathematician who studies um, dynamical systems, nonlinear dynamical systems. And he, he definitely knows much more about this, uh, the theory behind the, the solutions and so not solutions of these equations, but how to, to understand the structure of this chaotic attractor that comes out. But we try, just try to understand some of the basic features that are involved with these equations. So essentially, I mean, Lawrence wasn't really interested, I think, in this, in this boiling. So the, the, the physical system that he analyzes actually is this, this boiling pot on a stove, and you heat it from below. And then you see what's happening. In the beginning, nothing happens. Then you wait some time, and then some circulation cell uh, sets up. And then if you heat too much, of course, the water starts boiling or whatever, and then you get chaotic behavior. And, <clears throat> and But he wasn't interested really in this. He was interested to apply this idea to atmospheric, to the general circulation of the atmosphere, thinking that yeah, in the atmosphere, we have a little bit something like this. I mean, it's much more complicated because uh, th it's the sun that is heating the Earth's surface. But then convection, you know, the most of the energy is absorbed at, at the surface. We have discussed this. And then actually this, the, the atmosphere is heated from below, mainly. And so we have kind of a similar situation as we have in this. In this. But, but so he, he wants to, to understand more what's going on in the general circulation by looking at equations that are related to this part. So, so there are some, some basic quantities. There is a, as you can imagine, there's a warm temperature at the bottom and a colder temperature at the top. And if we are lucky, and this is assumed in this case, we can try to control these two temperatures as a boundary condition. But uh, of course, in the atmosphere, you know, it's not easy to control them. We just can make a measurement and say, oh, it's about like this and about like this. But in this, in this theory, it's kind of assumed that this is kind of a fixed quantity, this temperature difference between the bottom and the top, or the top and the bottom. So, so yeah, so what's happening is that if, if the heating is very small, then the, the temperature profile will be governed by heat diffusion. And you can show that the solution of that is just a linear temperature profile. So the temperature decre decreases, decreases if you heat just a little bit from the bottom to the top in a linear way. This is a solution of the diffusion equation. If you write down an equation, dt by dt with some coefficient with some kappa, and then d square 
t i d z is there a minus sign here i, I forgot um, no it's probably not um, then the the solution of this would be if we have a temperature that uh, that is linear uh, 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 that is constant in time and linearly changing with height then that would fulfill for example the stationarity in this equation here. then you have to adjust to the boundary conditions so that would be a solution of this diffusion equation but then if you heat more you start to get more complex behavior and and this is actually, this is what Lorenz then was investigating. First you start to have kind of organized, just rotate cells in your, in your heated pot that can either rotate in one direction or in the other direction. There's no, depends on the initial condition. Or then you can have more complex behavior. So in principle the equations actually that, that are used in the Lorentz system Of course, what, what equations do we use to solve the, the heated pot on the stove? We have to use the Navier-Stokes equation. In that case, for water, of course. But otherwise, they are the same equations that we are using throughout this course. So they are partial differential equations, nonlinear partial differential equations. Now, it turns out the fact that we have such a small pot in the uh, geometry, maybe where we can assume we have some height and some length. And we can assume there are only a few cells fit in this, in this pot. Makes it possible to try to insert, for example, if you have a temperature equation. Other terms. You may try, like we did already many times in this course, to assume, okay, let's say temperature or potential temperature, could be written in potential temperature, temperature is equal to some term like, let's say in this case, that from T times some cosine of, maybe we have some vertical dependence, some x dependence, cosine from x times whatever sine from z, uh, a so some, you assume some vertical and some horizontal structure in this, uh, this heated stove. And you insert this in the governing equations. And, and then a clever scientist have, has derived equations just for the time dependence of the amplitudes of, of what you have inserted. So you try to separate the time dependence from the spatial dependence. And that's the way... Uh, the, the so-called Lorentz equations have been derived. And as you can see, of course, we have nonlinearities. The, the main nonlinearity that is occurring is in the advection terms. But there is also the buoyancy term that in principle is, is nonlinear. So there are several nonlinearities in these equations. So that's the way these equations have been uh, derived, essentially for these three variables x, y, and z. It turns out it's a, you can approximately, it's a gross approximation because it's not, not at all exact, the solution. But approximately, you can try to describe the system with three variables, where it's written here. One of x is related to the time dependent of, 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 of a stream function. We know what the stream function is. If we have the stream function, we can derive the flow by calculating the rotation of the flow from it, and it's related to the vorticity. We know that the, the Laplacian of the stream function is the vorticity of the flow. So, so this, the, the x variable would be related to that. But the y and the z variables are related to temperature deviations from, this, from the linear equilibrium uh, profile. <coughs> so if you want to do it as an exercise, you can go into the original paper, it's, a, it's not given here in the references, but it's a paper by Salzman and maybe a few co-authors who, who wrote down, down the Navier-Stokes equation, made assumptions about the, 
you know, where temperature deviations could be maximum and minimized, and inserted these cosine and sine functions into the Navier-Stokes equations, and they derived then the, the equations for the coefficients in these equations. And so this, this three-layer model looks like this. So what is, when we write x dot, what does the dot stand for? This equation, time derivative, right? It's one way to, to write the time derivative. And then it turns for the x is a linear equation. The x variable is governed itself by a linear equation. But then it's coupled. You see, you cannot have the solution for x. There's some damping term here. So if, if this y wouldn't be here, then the solution would just be an exponential decay of this quantity. But it's not. There's this coupling to the y quantity. And then the equation for this y quantity for one of the temperature-related quantities is more complicated again. There is a damping term again that acts on the, on the y itself. But there, in this case, there's an exchange term, which is this term here. But there's also a nonlinear term. And this nonlinear term, x, y, co connects then again to another quantity, which is the z variable. And in the z, which is again related to a temperature, uh, there's also a damping term and a nonlinearity. The nonlinearity doesn't look so, you know, it's not like very complicated. It's just some quadratic terms. It's just two variables multiplied by each other in these two equations. That, you know, you, if you look at it, you think, oh, wait, I'm clever in math, I try to solve these equations. Just the three there is an is a ordinary differential equation, three coupled differential equations. It's not that difficult, in principle. But it's thought now that there's no analytical solution to these equations, as, as, as mathematicians think now, uh, they, they, they were able to show that you cannot find an analytical solution to this equation. So there are parameters that can be derived if you insert these equations in the, in the Navier-Stokes equations, the coefficients in the Navier-Stokes equations. One is the frontal number, which is explained here as the ratio of the kinetic vis viscosity that appears in the equations to the thermal diffusion coefficient. Then R is a very important number here, which is the Rayner number. It's a dimensionless measure of the temperature difference between the bottom and the top, which is controlled. And so this can be, if we increase the heating, we can assume that we can change this number R by increasing this temperature difference. And there's some, uh, the number B is uh, related to the, to the ratio of the size of the cells in our of the convecting cells, the horizontal size with respect to the vertical size of our pot, essentially. So that, that has been given just one number in order to, of course, in reality, there could be many, 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 many cells, and then this number would be different. But this is, is taken to be just some fixed number. And also, they have, they have found, OK, that this the uh, frontal number is for, for the mostly studied case set to 10, which is the number that people have derived for water. And then if we have B and, and P fixed, then the only number that we can vary and that makes the thing easy is this number R, which is essentially the temperature difference between the bottom and the top, which is the how much we heat our stove. So it's easy to, in an experiment, to adjust. And for numerical experiments, easy to adjust that we have just one number that we can vary. So we have to, since there is no analytical solution of this, we have to try to uh, solve these, question, these equations numerically. And if you are lazy, this is actually very easy. So if we have, for example, x from t plus delta t minus x from t, 
divided by delta t equals on that side then we have p times x from t uh, y minus x from t. We can simply use an Euler, if you want Euler forward scheme that you have applied yesterday probably in your exam to try to solve these equations. Very easy. I, I encourage you, it's fun to do it actually. I did it with a MAT, you can use a MATLAB code, but the Fortran code is the same thing. Or oh, I don't know, maybe even, I don't know, I don't know Python very well, but I think you by now you, you, you learn Python already, a just a little bit. Perhaps you can program this, it's so simple that probably even just within Python you can integrate these equations and, and, and find the solution. Because it's not a partial differential equation, it's just a coupled system of ordinary differential equations. The, the problem is, so I've done this uh, some years back. And you find, of course, you find nice things, the, the, the solution, uh, the time step, you can imagine, has to be quite small, but you can do it. Um, we will see, we will look at the solutions later. Um, basically, it works for, to find uh, for small Reynolds, uh, uh, sorry, Rayleigh, Rayleigh number. For a small Rayleigh number, it works quite well. You find the correct solutions. But if you increase R, it turns out that when changes in the behavior occur may depend crucially on your time step. So this, this you know, is a, you have done this in your numerical methods course, is first order accurate. It would be better to use instead a higher order numerical scheme. So you know how Runge Kutta, for example, Runge Kutta could be third or fourth order schemes that are more complicated to program, but that would allow then to use a time step uh, that is a little bit larger and then to have also a more accurate scheme anyway to, to solve the equations. And then maybe you can estimate better when certain thresholds of behavior, when you increase this parameter R, occur in your solutions. So the behavior of the solutions. So in order to understand the solutions, it's probably good to also to calculate the stationary state. And that is something I encourage you to do because it's so easy. So if this is the So what is the tactics to calculate the stationary states? And then once we have the stationary states, the thing is we could assess the stability of those stationary states. Because we may assume that stationary states are stable. That means that they will attract, wherever we start, they will attract the solutions. And then in the end, our solutions will end there. This, this will actually happen in some cases. So how do we calculate the stationary states? We set the time derivatives to zero, right? And then one stationary state is immediately obvious. Zero. If we insert everything is equal to zero, x. So one stationary state is x equal to y equal to z is equal to zero. And the physical interpretation of this state is no flow. This is our, our equilibrium state where we just have our linear profile of temperature and there's no flow. We heat our stove, our, our pot on the stove so little 
that there is no convection actually going on. The frictional forces are too strong for the, uh, for the motion to set in. And you can, for example, assess the stability of this stationary state. Then one, once we have found this state, we can, we can look for the other stationary states. And it's very easy to do. It's just a quadratic equation. So the other stationary states will look like this. x for the stationary states 2 and 3 will be square root plus minus square root of b times r minus 1. And ny would be b times r minus 1 again. And z is uh, r minus 1 would be the solutions. The and those solutions would indicate that there is a solution different from zero, which, is sta which could be stable or unstable. It depends. depends on, on how much we heat. And this solution exists only if we heat a little bit more. Because before, the stationary state zero was stable. Only if we heat some more, which makes r larger than 1, this, this, this normalized temperature difference, then this stationary state exists and can be stable for some values of R. And it's also, there's a physical meaning that there are two solutions. Because the rotation cells could rotate in one way or in the other way. Therefore, therefore we get two stationary states. And that could, be station, that could be stable for one, some values of R. But then if we increase R further, it turns out that this stationary state becomes again unstable. And the solutions, interestingly, still do not go to infinity or whatever. Our system does not explode. But they, they rotate around the stationary states that we have calculated and create this what we call chaotic behavior. It's always, there's always a damping. There's always a dissipation term that if our solutions become too large, they will be drawn back to the stationary states. But close to the stationary states, the solutions are unstable, so they will be kicked away from the stationary states. So they will try to, to, to go around it. And so if we look actually what is happening in this, in this solution that I did, so this is the trivial this was the trivial solution when the stationary state 0 was stable for small values of r. Then I start at some random point in the solution, in the, they, they all go to 0. There can be some overshooting. You see, I, if I start with small values for this variable y, then it first increases, but then decays. So for example, in, a, in the phase space that I will always show here between z and x, just randomly picked, then there would be show some increase initially, but then in the end there will be a, a decrease. Then, if we increase this parameter r a little bit, we get the possibility to get our two stationary solutions that are different from zero. So we find, we actually a way to find our stationary points without calculating them analytically. One solution goes into this stationary point, then if I pick another initial, con initial condition, I managed to get into this stationary point. Already something nonlinear, because the final solution depends on our initial conditions. It's not determined by just the stationary point. We need to know the initial conditions to go either into this or into that stationary state, which are on opposite sides here of the x axis, as you see. So it's plus minus one or the other. Then if we increase this R value further. And here, the problem comes if you just use a, a simple Euler forward scheme, first order. Then where these further changes are happening, they may depend on your time step. So how this more complex behavior now is dependent on the, vari of the variation of R may depend on the time step. And so that means we have not pick a good enough scheme. Euler forward. With Euler forward you can do all this stuff. <clears throat> but the accuracy where thresholds 
of your behavior, the cures may not be very good. So you may want to use a Runga Kutta fourth order or whatever scheme in order to be sure. But in principle, the behavior is, 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 is like that. So sometimes it seems that your, your solution is just oscillating. But then at some point, it, it shows a completely different behavior. And then it's oscillating again in, a, in another state. And, and so that, that looks in this diagram that like, OK, I start here, then I oscillate around here. But the oscillations become larger. And then it flips to oscillate around the other stationary state. This is kind of one of the viewpoints that people have in mind if they think about this Lorentz attractor. We can be around one close to one stationary state. Our solutions is there. We think the world is fine. Everything is OK. But suddenly, our oscillations become larger, and we go to a completely, we oscillate around a completely different stationary state. They could be far away. So it's a, it's a very nonlinear behavior that we can see. You know, we can see the time series, but that we can also see in the spa phase space diagram. And then we can have periods where we have completely chaotic behavior, no regularity at all in our behavior. So this is completely random, not going, getting too much amplitude because there's always a damping, but otherwise no regularity in the behavior at all. And then you have, again, it depends, you can play this game for, for any values you, uh, you want. And so mathematicians, of course, has, have studied this behavior. They have, they have studied the details of this behavior. It turns out, in order to get a chaotic system with an autonomous uh, system, without time, without that you include a time delay, you need at least three variables. You need a, a nonlinear system with three variables. You cannot have the behavior, otherwise it would be too easy when you, you pick two variables. Mm -hmm. uh, but that wouldn't work. You cannot have this complex behavior with, um, with just uh, two variables. There can be nonlinear systems, of course, with two variables, but they show kind of they, they cannot show this chaotic attractor behavior that we find here. You can have limit cycles in two variables, but there cannot be this chaotic behavior that we have in this system here. So it's a uh, very interesting. And so. So yeah, nowadays, as I, as I mentioned before, people try to squeeze, you try, you, you write down the equations, for example, recently, uh, Franco Molteni was now here visiting, he is interested in the North Atlantic Oscillation that we have to discuss, and we wanted to, to write a low order model for the North Atlantic Oscillation Variability. And he managed to to squeeze the equation so much, to approximate the equation so much, that he was able to, to find actually equations that formally look exactly like the Lorentz equations uh, for the North Atlantic Oscillation Variability. It's great, because those equations have been studied so much, you can go into the literature and, and, and simply you know, show some figures of those equations when they when bifurcations occur, when changes of the behavior occur, and so on. So this is, uh, this is, these equations are used as a prototype for nonlinearity in, in atmospheric behavior. And this, so they are so simple. This is really amazing if you think about it. Essentially, so what, what the basic message is that if we have two solutions uh, two initial conditions, and we try to find a solution that now they may vary very quickly from each other. It depends now on the on the detail of the, of the situation how fast they they deviate from each other. Or you may have a different situation where they stay very close to each other for a long time, and then maybe later deviate. 
it always it all depends on on what are the initial conditions. Where are we? Practical terms for that, it's a good question. Um, if, because if you have a pot and you start the heating, there's, no, there's not much in the initial conditions that you could change. Uh, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, I, I guess for the practical case of a heated pot on a stove, it's very difficult to, to modify or to pick initial conditions. The initial conditions are somehow, you know, when, once you put the pot on a stove, there's some rotation already, and then that's the initial condition or something like this. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to control in that case the initial conditions. But the idea is in principle this. You have, you have small variations in your, you know, you do this experiment several times, you put the, stop, the pot on your stove and you, that means you perturb a little bit the state of the fluid and then you start heating and it depends on how exactly you put the, the pot on the stove, uh, uh, what will happen in the, in the future. And the, in, in reality, that they, they don't have to be, this is enough to, to have an infinitesimal tiny difference in, already after a few hundred time steps, the solutions will be completely different. So we don't even have to think of how to create these different initial conditions. It's just some random perturbation, some random, you know, a fly was fly, flying over your pot and created some small perturbation to your, to your system that can create different initial conditions. Yeah, it's, but it's a, good, it's a good question. If we apply this then to weather forecasts, of course the problem lies with the fact also there we think we have just one, there's one initial condition. We, we measure the atmosphere now and we want to do a forecast. We know the system is, is nonlinear as, as, as these equations here, only much more complicated, much higher dimension. Uh, it's, a, it's a full Navier-Stokes equation, partial differential, partial coupled, coupled nonlinear differential equations. But in principle, there's just one state at initial time. Now the problem recurs if we measure the state. If we measure the state, even the tiniest measurement error tells us we don't know the initial condition exactly. We have a small uncertainty. And that's enough to make the cause for, okay, there are possibilities of having different initial conditions. Just by making a measurement, we if you want to follow up this even further. Even in principle, it should be possible kind of to measure the atmosphere without perturbing it, no? because of the, there could be the uncertainty principle. Whenever we touch the system, we perturb something to it. So maybe this is not even in principle possible to exactly measure our atmosphere, the, the initial condition of our atmosphere. But OK, this is much, much beyond what the problems that we have. So our, our measurement errors in temperature, if we have a very precise thermometer, would be 0 0.1 degree. That's, that's, that's not microscopic. That's, uh, that's a real number. The measurement errors for wind would be much larger. And we have even a much bigger problem. Because over many parts of the ocean, we don't have direct measurements of these quantities. So we have to derive them maybe from satellite measurements. And, and, and so... Um, or using model interpolations of these values to guess some values over the oceans, so that the errors will be much larger than, than that. So, so this initial condition uncertainty gives this problem. We know that we know after having looked at these, uh, these solutions that we start two integrations 
after, it turns out in reality, a few days, the solutions may be completely different. For no reason. There's no systematic reason, essentially. Apart from the initial conditions were slightly different. This is the, the property of a chaotic behavior. So, 68, let's look at this. Okay, now here we see, first discuss this. Here we see illustrated, this, these are again what, what I showed you before, this, the, and the phase space, the solutions for the Lorentz equations. And people have made this experiment. Sometimes you start with a set of initial conditions, which is illustrated by the circle here. So you have you. You, you run an ensemble of simulations picking the initial conditions in this situation here, in this, in this area here. And then it turns out, actually, the solutions stay very close together in this situation for a long time. But in other cases, you can have this behavior. So at some point, there is some kind of deviation of the solution. And then, if you pick other initial conditions, like this one is here actually, then you, it turns out you don't even know anymore after a few times that if you are on this side of the, of this butterfly wings or on this side of this butterfly wings, people interpret this as, looks like a butterfly, no? So can you depend strongly on the, on the situation? And this is also what, what you will see if you look at uh, weather forecasts. In the weather forecasts and climate forecasts, seasonal forecasts, we now always look at ensembles of forecasts because of this. We know a single forecast will not tell us how confident can we be with our prediction. We always have to have at least two forecasts. If they stay close together, maybe we can, we can have some confidence in the forecast. But if they if they deviate immediately, we cannot have any confidence. We don't know what's happening. Could be anything. And of course, two maybe are not enough. Because if, if they deviate so much, we want to say, oh, maybe this is just an outlier. Maybe 90% of our members stay in one uh, range of the temperature, and just one outlier lies here, and we have picked this by chance. So we want to have an as large as possible ensemble to, to fill our phase space as, as good as possible, which in the illustration here is done for the Lorentz system, but in a more kind of general sense, we can think about this as a, this could be a weather forecast, and, and we, have, we pick several initial conditions that are all consistent with our measurement, knowing that we have a measurement error, doesn't make sense to have it one big grid point where we measure 37.1 degree. We only use this 37.1 degree. Maybe it was 37.2 degrees. So we have to admit for all these possibilities. And so we create an ensemble of climate runs, of weather runs, based on this initial condition ensemble of slightly changed initial conditions. There's a whole theory behind how you best perturb your initial conditions. The big weather center, they try not to just, you could just randomly perturb them. But that may be not the most efficient way, because what you want is, since we know we can only, ideally we would have maybe one million ensemble runs, but that would be very expensive. If you try to do a good job already with 100 or 50, we what the weather centers argue is we need, we try to find the best perturbations that make the growth maximum. Because we haven't gained anything if we just have perturbations that are, stay very close together, but we, have picked, we haven't picked the perturbations very clever. If, if we can find perturbations within our uncertainty that make the, the distance between two solutions grow faster, it's better. Because we have, we, have, we have understood the full uncertainty range of our forecast. Because they are all in principle consistent with our initial uh, measurement uncertainty. So the, the more spread 
we call it spread, we can get in a short time the better it is because everything that we prescribed was consistent with our initial measurement, consistent with the initial measure, uh, initial conditions. So the, all the main forecasting centers, the European Weather Center uh, in the United States, they have methods to find these vectors. There, there can be different techniques how to find these. They are called singular vectors. The, uh, the ECMWF uses a technique that is called singular vectors. They linearize the system and try to find the, the vectors that grow fastest. Think about cyclones. What, what do I have to perturb in the initial conditions to make a cyclone either grow very fast or not grow at all. We want to have these two possibilities included if they are both consistent with our initial conditions. Then both could happen. And that could affect now our prediction for Europe a lot. If we have, yeah, there could be a mega cyclone or there could also be nothing. It's an important information. At least better than saying, oh, there, there's no chance to have a cyclone at all. And so this is, this is done in the mega centers. In US, they're doing something something other, maybe more intuitive. They start some simulations with picking randomly, perturbing randomly the initial conditions according to what could be a measurement error. They integrate for, let's say, if you, one day. They take this new state, scale it back, because they assume what has grown now may be the fastest growing modes in our system. So they, they scale that back to make it small, consistent with the initial uh, measurement error, and run it again, and so on. So in the end, they hope what is growing within one day will be the fastest growing modes in our nonlinear atmosphere, atmospheric system. It's, a, it's, a, it's called um, growth. No, it's called breathing. Breathing, bro. Breathing. This is called breeding technique. They, they do exactly this, breeding. Very good. And then, in some centers, they also think that's not the case here. This system is autonomous, is a, is a closed, is a deterministic system. Okay, this is the expression, deterministic. That means once I have given the initial condition, the solution is determined, even if it depends very strongly on the initial condition. But what they sometimes do in the weather centers, not everywhere, but sometimes say, we don't even know our equations very well. So we don't know that, for example, these, these damping terms that are, could be related to boundary layer friction, we don't know how exactly they are in nature. We can, we can use something in our model, but they not, may not be nature. So they put some random perturbations during the during the model run, they have some random perturbations to our simulation itself. That is completely different to a deterministic system. And, and, and so, so that could be what we call model uncertainty that sometimes is used. The ECMWF, they are doing this. They use a physical, this, this uh, f stochastic physics, they call it. They perturb the physics during the simulation in order to, to increase. You can imagine that that increases our uncertainty. We have two, in principle, identical, nearly identical simulations, but now we have some randomness in the physics itself that makes the solution deviate. And in the end, after some time, we get to a forecast. And so assume now that we have run many, 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 many ensemble members, we get into, a, we get into what is our forecast uncertainty which could be this, this dark shading here. And ideally, that would be a point, right? The solution, you know, if this, this would be the observed, then the observed case, the observed, maybe one ensemble member just by randomness. We, we cannot know which before. But by perhaps one ensemble member has just picked the right observed solution that we can verify later. But we don't know what is before, so there's no way to to pick that before. But then the, the main idea behind weather forecasting and, and climate forecasting is 
that, okay, this is not a satisfactory uh, situation because we don't have certainty. There's always an uncertainty. However, if our climatological range of this variable, that means we measure temperature on a certain day in Trieste for the last 50 years, and let's say for today's date, the range of our experience is we can have maximum temperature in Trieste on the, what is not today, 20th of March, that ranges from minus 5 extreme to plus 20, but our forecast can reduce this range. Let's say our forecast says it's from 0 to plus 10, then we have gained at least something, right? Then our forecast was useful. Otherwise, we, it's better to use if our forecast cannot do this, we can equivalently just say our past experience tells us that the temperature range that we can expect for the 20th of March is, is between minus 5 and plus 20. Extremely large range. Hopefully weather forecasts are better than that. We can reduce this range. Sometimes they are not. But in this case, it's indicated that they are because we fall within this, this climatological, what we call climatological range of expected values. So Lawrence uh, discussed this two kinds of predictability that are related with this. And this is something interesting to discuss probably. So what we have looked at now is the initial condition problem. We try to measure the initial condition, maybe admit that, that our measurement has an error, so we run an ensemble to make an initial condition predictability. Lawrence has already identified by looking at the growth rates that this may work only for, for some regions, exotropical, let's say Trieste, that may work maybe maximum two for one week. After that, it's true that weather forecasting models nowadays run up to two weeks. But this is more kind of a, if you look at a two week forecast, you know, no, I've never seen a case where if you have many ensemble members, where they all stick very close together in Trieste at least. There you will always have a huge spread, which means there's essentially no predictability. But who knows? Maybe, you know, maybe there can be situations where something is constraining, some initial condition is constraining our forecast so much that it remains long. But the theory says beyond two weeks, the errors will have grown because of any small perturbations such that there can be no predictability of the first kind, initial condition predictability in the atmosphere that is, uh, is useful. So why do we do seasonal and climate forecasts then? Is a contradiction, no? In principle, we can only predict so long. So the idea is uh, maybe it's useful to look at the following curve. So this is from a, from the seasonal forecasting system that we will look at on Monday and Tuesday next week. You will get some data to analyze. Here I looked at essentially two forecasts, or in this case even 15 forecasts, for one grid point in Europe. And I look at the distance between, the average distance between two of these forecasts. What is the average distance? So I took one minus the other, and then I can do this many times and take the average distance between two forecasts. At the beginning, of course, day one, they are very close together just some kind of the initial perturbation. Two forecasts are very close together. Then, okay, one day average gives us already some, some measurable distance. And then, okay, there's some random behavior, but essentially the error, the, the distance between two forecasts grows, the spread grows, and then saturates. So in the exotropics, as you can see here, this is days. This is a grid point in Europe. This saturation can occur after one or two weeks, and the value is about four degrees Celsius. Interestingly, 
if you go to a grid point in Africa, on the equator in this case, this is taken just a random grid point in Africa on the equator on the, on the land, and you do this estimation, yeah, the error grows quickly probably in the beginning, but then the situation is at a very, very, very small uh, error. The, 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 all, almost all the forecasts show the same value, below one, the saturation value may be below one degree, around one degree. So very different behavior to the extratropics. And now comes essentially Lorentz's idea of the predictability of the second kind. So, okay, we have this uncertainty, there's nothing, this is the, the, the full range. But what if some external forcing can perturb our system? So, if we think about the Lorentz system, that would be a, a change of the parameters that sta changes the stationary states. So in order, in, instead of rotating about something here, we change that and rotate about something there. And if this distance is large enough, maybe we can say something about the behavior of our system. If we think about seasonal forecasting, it could be El Niño. If El Niño is strong enough, it perturbs our atmosphere strong enough, maybe more than one degree, you can assume that it's actually much easier to get a, a relevant signal in the tropical regions where our saturation ratio of, uh, our saturation value of this error growth is much smaller. So it's much easier to create any relevant signal in the equatorial regions as compared to the extratropical regions where the saturation value was four degrees or something like this. So you would have to have a mega El Nino probably, a 10 degrees El Nino to get any signal in the exotropics. But it's enough to have a normal El Nino to get some signal in the tropical regions. So the saturation value may be very relevant. So <coughs> um, Lawrence called this predictability of the second kind, where where we actually do not rely on our initial condition predictability, but we assume that there is some external forcing for the atmosphere could, could be a big El Nino event that can change our attractor in a way that now we can assess the behavior of our weather, which is always random, around the attractor that is slightly shifted compared to the, to the way it was the year before when there was no El Nino. This is the only way we can think of long-term predictions. And the same is true for climate predictions, of course. For climate predictions, we know there's no way we can, for 100 years ahead, predict the weather on the 24th of, of January or the 24th of December. Right? There's no way. The only way we can think of it is that if, hopefully not, but if CO2 concentrations incre increase a lot, we double or, or, or even more increase our CO2 concentration. That, put, that perturbs our climate system so much that it shifts the, the attractor so much that we can see the signal. Then it makes sense, okay, yeah. the climate will be five degrees warmer on average, then even we can see this in this one grid point in Europe. In the tropics we will see it for sure, but even in the grid point in Europe we will see the shift of, of five degrees. It will, it will stand out from the background of our, of our ensemble spread. But you can also uh, guess that if, if this perturbation is small, if, we, if you do a climate change assessment for a, for a scenario which says the CO2 concentration is maybe increasing only by 20%, then you will have a rough time to prove using an ensemble method that there's any statistically significant change in our climate as compared to previous climate. because the noise, the spread between the simulations may be so large that you will not find, okay, climate is not changing. Thank, thankfully, it would, be, a, it would be a good outcome, outcome if, the, if the perturbations are weak. Okay. 
Of course, the whole thing becomes a little bit. When I what I said before essentially applies to the viewpoint that I'm looking that I'm looking at the atmosphere, because if I look at the system in a more general sense, of course, what is done if I uh, look at the seasonal forecast, it's an ocean atmosphere coupled system. Then it's again that there is an El Nino or not is not an external forcing anymore. It's part of the system that I predict. So then it comes into play that there are parts of the climate system that evolve on a much slower time scale than other parts of the climate system. So the weather always evolves on a weather time scale, which is a few days, or Rossby waves time scale. But ENSO may evolve on a time scale from two to seven years, and therefore gives us some low frequency variations that from an atmospheric point of view I can, I can use the idea of some external forcing that is coming from this very low frequency perturbation. The same is true for carbon dioxide. If I include carbon dioxide in a model that has the carbon cycle included in the ocean and so on, it's not prescribed anymore, then it becomes, becomes part of the dynamical system. And I have to think about it a little bit different. So we want to start now. Let's not discuss this. To look at some practical measures of predictability. It's now hands on. This is the these are the a few very basic techniques that that you can use in the next two lab sessions in order to assess predictability in our seasonal hindcast system. What, what you will be delivered is this system 4, what is called system 4, one of the ECMWF forecast systems. And we look at hindcasts, of course. So we don't look at a real forecast. We look at, at, a, at, a, at forecasts that are, however, done in the past. So in this case, from the 1980s to, I have the data set uh, right now, to 2010, uh, 12, it's already outdated. There's now a new forecasting system, System 5. And maybe in one of the next lecture courses, I will try to, to use that data set. But anyway, there's no having a new seasonal forecast or hindcast data set doesn't mean it's any better than the old one. Uh, there, are, there are certain things that are definitely improved but sometimes things also are uh, not improved at all and they get worse in the new forecasting system. So this is the, the foster forecasting system we will look at and then we look at hindcast because hindcast we have to verify if, 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 these, if this forecasting system has performed well in the last 30 years. It's our only way to make a guess will it perform also well maybe in future. And of course, you can think of, since they know, the, the, the forecasters, forecasters, the model developers, they know, of course, that the model will be used to look at the past 30 years. And since before you, you want to use the forecast, you want to verify if this model has performed well or not. And you may think, oh, maybe they cheat. Maybe now they go, they look how the model is performing in the last 30 years, Oh, they, oh no, this is not good, so I tune the model again, make, try something, make it a little bit. Cheating is not allowed there. Okay. The, the system is frozen. Once they have decided the system, everything, physical parameterizations, everything is frozen, and then they run their hindcast. You can trust, there's no cheating. And then if the model performs well in this hindcast period, it's what it is. This is uh, then you find out. If the model is performing badly in, in, in some cases and very well in other cases. Anyway, uh, a good exercise to understand what we can learn from seasonal forecasts. These are seasonal, these will be seasonal forecasts. In principle, now they talk about sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasts. So, but this system already is a sub-season, so you have, you have daily data. You have, uh, the output in principle is daily. We will look at monthly means in our analysis to make it easier. Uh, but in principle, you have from day 
one onwards daily data. So, so, but in this time, this is still a seasonal forecasting system. Now they try to be a more, um, more generic. They, so the, now they start more often. There were generic starting dates in, in let's say February, May, May for the summer prediction, November for the winter prediction, August for the autumn prediction, and so on. But now in this in this sub-seasonal to seasonal project, they start much more frequently. They, you can use the data immediately. There's no so you have much more spacing of of of, of your seasonal forecast and you try to use them also on, on time scales that are shorter than seasonal really. Whereas this system was still only used for seasonal forecast, seasonal outlook. So if we want to have a summer prediction, we look at the forecast that were initialized on the 1st of May. We throw away the May because the May is not a proper forecast because this these forecasts are released only on, the, let's say, the 10th of May because of this trying to find the best perturbations. There's some. So the first month is not a clean forecast, let's put it that way. But then from June on, if a forecast was really initialized the 1st of May, from June on we can take it as a seasonal forecast. May wouldn't be, you can still use it for research purposes. But it's not, a, it's not an honest forecast because you have used already some of the measured values in May are already included in this forecast. So it's not a, really a, a proper forecast for May. Okay. Some measurements. So one thing we can... Oh no, for, for to understand now we want to look at... Let's look at a seasonal forecast of... Nino index. So this is uh, from one forecast, this is the American Forecasting Center. Seasonal forecasts of the Nino. This is Nino 3 index, so the SST anomaly in some box in the Pacific, and this is Nino 3.4. This box is a little bit further to the central Pacific. And as you can see, this is measurement. This is for the Nino event 2016. And then, and then initialized maybe here in February. And then we look at the forecast of the model. And then you can see what's happening. Um, for some time, the ensemble members stay close together. But then by, by the next year, there's uncertainty if there will be still a Nino conditions, neutral conditions, or La Nino conditions. This is the typical situation that we have. So if we want to measure something, we have two, two important measures. One is if there is still a difference of this ensemble with a zero anomaly. So we have some, that is what we call a signal. If the ensemble mean shows something that is different from zero in terms of anomaly, then we call that signal. So in the first month, there's clearly a signal. But then if we go beyond that, then the signal will be very small. And there's the alternative quantity that tells us what is the spread among, amongst the ensemble members, what we call the noise that we, we can derive from our ensemble. This noise, in the beginning, in the first month, is very small. So the ensemble members stay very close together, small compared to the signal. You see, the, the variance of, this, of the variations here are very small. The signal is still large. But then if we go, for example, to August the next year, we have a huge spread, a huge variance in our uh, ensemble members. And the signal, the ensemble mean, I think, is, is one of the curves here would be tiny compared to this uncertainty. So that means intuitively, right, we cannot say anything anymore. If the signal is small compared to our uncertainty, we are not able to make a prediction. Or we can make a prediction, but it will be extremely uncertain. So if you want to formalize this,
we think of having, to make it simple, we think of having a quantity that can be any quantity. Think of temperature, rainfall, temperature of any level, the vertical, any quantity you can think of. A model variable in this case, because for the time being we talk about model derived um, predictability. And this variable has two indices. One indice runs in, um, in time, so we have a time dependence. And the other, the J variable, runs in as an ensemble member. So we count time and ensemble member. And we assume we can look at this at every grid point. So if we, we should, could carry in another dimension, but we say, OK, we don't care. We do this analysis at every grid point separately. So in the end, we can have a map of, 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 of each of these individual analysis that we do in, in time and for the ensemble members, because we can do it at every grid point, ind independently from the other grid point. So we don't have to carry this additional di uh, dimension. We can just assume that we do it at every grid point separately. So what we then call the noise is what we just said. If we, have the, if we define the ensemble mean by averaging all the ensemble members at a certain time, the ensemble mean can depend on time. In our, you remember, that depends on time. And then we can calculate the, the variance of our deviations from this ensemble mean. If all ensemble members are the same, this will be zero. Because then the ensemble mean is equal to each of the simulations. Then the noise is zero. Or the noise can be large. So this variance is our is, is, is what is called noise. It's one important quantity. The other that we just discussed is the signal. The signal would be governed by the, if we calculate now the time mean of the ens uh, ensemble mean, the signal would be determined by the deviations of our ensemble mean by this time mean. So this would be if the time mean is zero, like in our, if we look at anomalies, anomalies is just taking away the time mean. That would be just the difference between, between the ensemble mean of these simulations here and the zero. This is our, and then we have to calculate the variance of this. And so this gives us some information about, about what we can learn from our forecast. Because the first thing that we can do is we can calculate the signal-to-noise ratio. Simply the signal divided by the noise. Because one problem is now, if our noise by chance in the case is zero, then we get infinite here. I mean, we are extremely lucky, of course, because that means our system was 100% predictable. But it also it's, it could be quite annoying that our the values of the signal to noise ratio can vary between essentially zero, if we have no predictability at all, and infinite if we have large predictability, can have very large values. So actually, what, but when we want to say, okay, what is a useful signal-to-noise ratio? A useful signal-to-noise ratio is probably if our signal is at least as large as the noise. Then, okay, they are the same, so perhaps you can say something, right? Ideally, our signal would be larger than the noise. Then we can definitely say something. If the, if the noise is larger than the signal, in principle, we cannot say anything. 
And unfortunately, signal to noise ratio la uh, larger than one is very rare in seasonal forecasting analysis. This is something we have to get used to. There can still be there can still be values in a seasonal forecast, even if there's some small information. Don't forget. But the, the strong case, oh, we can definitely say that you know, the seasonal forecast, there will be more rainfall on the seasonal time scale in Europe or in Africa, and we are 100% sure about this, because our signal-to-noise ratio is, is larger than one. This situation will essentially, on a seasonal time scale, Never occur, or nearly never occur. So, for example, this is uh, shown in a in this figure here. Actually, for this is in a calculation of the signal to noise ratio, not from a seasonal forecast system, but in this case from an uh, atmospheric general circulation model that has been forced by the same SSTs. So we have reduced the uncertainty a little bit. So this is an overestimation of the signal because we have assumed all the sea surface temperatures for all, all ensemble members are the same. So we just perturb the atmosphere. So this gives us an overestimation of the signal and an underestimation of the noise. But no, essentially an underestimation of the noise, not the signals should be the same. Um, and this is now applied to rainfall. And as you can see, signal to noise, so the values can become much larger than one. One is this line here. It's larger than one, it's only over tropical oceans. So if you live on a tropical island, maybe, you can be lucky that there is seasonal predictability. But other than that, over land, yeah, maybe, in South America. Maybe South Central America. There are some indications of, of something like that. But uh, uh, extratropical land, even Africa, unfortunately, very difficult to find any values larger than one for this case. This is just one for one season, taking the seasonal forecast, let's say, for November for the DJF season. But you would get very similar results taking any other seasons. It's a challenge for you. Find in the exercise that we do on this system for try to find anything that over land that gives us a signal to noise ratio larger than one in a seasonal forecast. It's a challenge. If, if you find any variable that would be useful. If you look at geopotential height, yeah, we find a very similar, this is now a different projection. So we look from the North Pole essentially over North America here. This, this is North America. So the tropical, this is now 200 hectopascal geopotential height. Gives us some indication of the wave structure, Rossby wave structures that could influence climate. <clears throat> and of course, in the tropics, again, we see values of the signal to noise ratio much larger than one. But unfortunately, you know, they go maybe up to 30 north or something like this. So this would be one field that you could win to find a signal-to-noise ratio much larger than one. But it, it's not useful to make any prediction for surface, either temperature or rainfall, because this is, this is not a very useful quantity. It's so homogeneous, it's just geopotential height anomaly that, that this large values everywhere do not guarantee any any forecast for a surface variable that, that has a signal to noise ratio larger than one. And if you look at the nodes, remember, our Rossby wave propagation, ENSO, induced Rossby wave propagation, this is mostly what we see in the seasonal forecast. We see increased signal to noise ratio where our Rossby wave, ENSO Rossby wave propagation has its maximum values. Remember that from our lecture course where there were in the Aleutian, Aleutian region and then propagating into North America. But even here, we don't get to one. Signature noise ratio, even there, in the middle of the ocean, where we get this, the strongest ENSO-induced anomaly on a seasonal time scale, the signature noise ratio 
will not get to one. So the noise in the atmosphere, our, our randomly created Rossby waves, are always more powerful than the ENSO induced signal. It's a very you know, bad news for seasonal forecast. But you know, then, okay, knowing this, we have to try to make use, to find some use of seasonal forecast. Work hard to find something that can be useful. I will stop soon, so we will finish maybe next in the lab. This is also okay. We can do the rest in the lab. I just want to introduce one more quantity, which I prefer a little bit more personally, which is called the uh, R limit or theoretical limit of predictability, which is just a nonlinear transformation of the signal to noise ratio. So if you have the signal to noise ratio, you can calculate this R limit. And it's essentially the signal divided by the total variance. So signal divided by signal plus noise. But signal plus noise is the, you can add variances. So that is the total variance contained in our ensemble. And this number has the advantage that it varies only between 0 and 1. 0 is if the signal is 0, and there's no predictability at all. And 1 is uh, the case if the noise is 0, then this is 1, and we have perfect predictability. All ensemble members stay very close to each other. So it's a, it's a useful quantity, and it, you can ins quickly insert this. It turns out that the signal-to-noise ratio, we said, if it's 1, it's maybe useful, that translates to an R limit value of 0 0.7. So instead of looking at the signal-to-noise ratio, we could look at this nicer quantity that just varies between 0 and 1. And actually the interpretation of this is, this is the maximum if you compare your ensemble mean with observations, this is the maximum correlation scale you could expect from your ensemble. It's one of the interpretations of this best thing. You see, it cannot be negative because ideally your model should always have a positive correlation compared to the observation. Of course. In reality, then, it's not necessarily the case, but this is just an upper limit. And, and uh, so it's uh, another useful um, measure of our forecast skill. There are many more measures of forecast skill. Some of them are related to information theory. And if you go into that field of analyzing predictability, you may want to go into those more complex skill measures. But I think to start an analysis, to understand, it's, it's very useful to start with these basic um, prediction skill measures. There are some examples of this R limit value. Here's one. This is now for a different season. So this is for the short rain, East African short, short rain seasons. Again, AGCM, so same sea surface temperatures, but varied initial conditions in the atmosphere. And, and as you can see here, the values are go from 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Over land, it's very difficult to find anything that is large. We have the islands here, of course, that are strongly influenced by ENSO, and therefore give us a very high potential predictability. And don't underestimate this, but in Eastern Africa, there are values that go into this green here. So 0 0.4, 0 0.4 is not 0 0.7. 0 0.7 would be the threshold for useful. But 0.4 is, a, is already something. And there's something else, actually, which we will not discuss here. This is, of course, a very tough test. It's a point by point comparison of predictability, point by point. Sometimes you could have an advantage by taking area averages. So if you take, for example, now you look at this and see, OK, here there seems to be some predictability. Let's not try to do this point by point. But we do an average of rainfall, in this case, over the whole region. Maybe that has a higher, of course, you can again predict, uh, assess the predictability of such a larger 
index, not just the value of at, at each grid point, there's a tendency for that having more predictability. So the area averaging may give you some gain if you're completely frustrated by the fact that you cannot find any predictability. One idea would be to take a, an area average over the region you're interested in. Maybe for India, for Pakistan, or for, for Eastern Africa here, area indices, area average indices could give higher predictability than the point by point comparison. Maybe there was one more. This is one. Oh yeah, this is this is our limit for some quantities. Uh, one is the land surface temperature. And uh, okay, it's all positive. It has to be positive. Yellowish is small and reddish. If you go to reddish, it's okay. So we can we can see this indication that we had that the that the saturation value of our of our ensemble was smaller in the tropics compared to the exotropics, we see an effect here because this R limit value for temperature is actually quite large over tropical land masses. So there is some possibility of predicting temperature over tropical land mass, but exotropics very small. Apart from here, ENSO, some ENSO impact in North America. MSLP, rainfall is always the most interesting quantity, of course. Again, we come to the same conclusion, also for this R limit. A very good rainfall prediction is possible in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where no one essentially cares about it, almost no one. And apart from that, it's very difficult, difficult to find regions. You have to be happy with already the values that goes 0 0.5, 0 0.6 maybe if you're over land, but essentially you know, this is the this is the truth for seasonal predictions and yeah but I'm not sure that this has been exploited exploited for every season for every quantity in in a in a very detailed and for every lead time. We are looking here always at a certain lead time, also for all quantities. So maybe one can be lucky to find some predictability of a seasonal forecast. Uh, but generally, the indication is, is like this. High predictability, where we have ENSO going on, that gives us some predictability. So the models either have it in their initial conditions, or the initial conditions are so close to an ENSO event that they can predict its evolution. And then, and then the only thing the model has to do is to provide the correct teleconnections of this. Uh, but as you can see, as soon as we go further away from the tropics, there's almost nothing left in terms of predictability of rainfall in this case. But it's a challenge. Maybe we find something. Subseasonal could be slightly better. Maybe there's some some predictability. So I think we will conclude this on Monday in the lab, doesn't matter, by looking at some more measures of the predictability and then we will, we will look at the, this data set of the seasonal forecasting system that has been prepared some years ago and you, you are able to do some of this analysis practice. You have no more exams, right? In the near future. So you have plenty of time. Yeah, that okay. So you have plenty of time then to do the this analysis, which I think is interesting. Because you can focus on the region that you are interested in and look for some predictability features. We we will discuss what you could potentially look at.
sometimes I feel a little bit bad to, to talk so negative about seasonal predictability. But I think it's, uh, the, one has to be honest, right? This is, this is what it is. And then whatever we can gain, if you are clever in the future maybe to find something that is predictable or to improve models, who knows? Maybe the models are currently in a state where they are not able to, to get some of the features correct. This is why in, in Europe seasonal forecasts is essentially treated as a research project. Whereas in US, where we are closer to the El Nino phenomenon, seasonal forecasts are possible to some extent. But in Europe, this is, this is almost hopeless. The only, whenever we look at seasonal forecasts, the only signal we see is it will be warmer probably. It will be warmer than the average over the last 30 years because there's global warming going on. And that's it.